How will the chips fall? 80 million Americans tuned in live for Monday's first presidential debate between Hillary Clinton and Donald Trump. The encounter delivered the promised jabs, blows, put-downs, and self-promotion. Strongest asset, maybe by far, is my temperament. I have a winning temperament. I know how to win. Secretary Clinton. Woo, okay. <laughs> Established media gave the advantage to the Democratic nominee, but what will ordinary voters really take away from the first of three face-offs beyond the one-liners? How did the candidates fare on the issues that could swing the election? And have we really entered that post-truth era in campaigning that pundits predicted? Today in the France Fenquette debate, who won and who will win? And with us to talk about it from Washington, Democratic strategist Richard Fowler. Thanks for being with us. Thanks as well to James Robbins, senior fellow at the American Foreign Policy Council and columnist for USA Today. Minter Dial, he's a digital media consultant whose documentary, The Last Ring Home, will be screened on American public television station PBS. November... November 11th. November 11th. Time. All right. And uh, journalist and blogger Jean-Pierre Larochelle, director of The Political Forum. Thank you. Where you discuss... Um, Political events, political analysis. Right here in the French capital. Right. The France Fan Get Debate, where you can join the conversation on Facebook and Twitter, the hashtag F24Debate. You can also vote in our SNAP poll. Uh, does Monday's debate give voters an idea of uh, who's got the temperament to be uh, president? I'll, um, I'll start with you, Jean-Pierre La Rochelle, on this one. Uh, Donald Trump, we heard him there saying he's got the temperament. D does, it, does an event like last night's give the voters the impression of who's got the temperament to be the head. I think the event last night gives people the clear contrast. These two candidates couldn't be more different. You have one candidate who is clearly uh, on the establishment style. She prepped uh, unbel unbelievably for this event. And then you've got Donald Trump, who is freewheeling and uh, frequently goes off the reservation. It was a style that worked well for him in the Republican primary debates. It's a little different story, I think, on a one-on-one -on -one debate. Did he really uh, go off the rails? Because I noticed there were some pointed jabs and uh, also uh, uh, shout outs to key states that he made. Uh, he s seemed to, to sort of know what he was doing in his own Trumpian way. Well, he definitely had bullet points that he wanted to take off, you know, be able to cite Ohio, Pennsylvania, Michigan, and he, he wanted, he obviously tried to find ways to go on script in that regard. But afterwards, there are times where you inevitably see him, even in his body language. The interesting thing to do is just sometimes look at the body language and you see how he's reacting internally. Richard Fowler, uh, does an exercise like the one we saw, uh, we do not have Richard Fowler. We have, uh, we'll, tr we'll try to fix the, the problem. Uh, do we have James Robbins? Yes, I'm here. Okay, James. Uh, what do you think about, and first of all, the exercise of a debate? And is was the one you witnessed on Monday different from all the others we've seen through the ages? Um, well, I think it was definitely different. Uh, we had two candidates, and I agree, they were uh, two different types of candidates. Uh, Hillary Hillary Clinton, the establishment candidate, gave us, I think, exactly the kind of debate performance that we're used to seeing. I think that she was very competent with what she wanted to do, and I think that she communicated to her audience, to her voters. Donald Trump came in uh, with his uh, insurgency, with his movement. He gave his own style of debate. I think he very effectively spoke to his voters. And what was interesting to me is that while some polls showed that she was the winner, a lot of the reader-based polls and other, uh, other type of uh, interactive media like that uh, was a blowout for him. So it shows just two different audiences they were speaking to, and they each did well uh, to their respective voters. What does that say, Minter Dial? Because uh, we live in an era, right, where uh, you uh, friend people who think like you on, on Facebook and Twitter and you uh, e each side preaching to the converted? Yeah, I think we see this massive divisiveness and you might friend people who speak your values, but then even if you have a friend that speaks another one, you, want, you unfollow them. And you just try to focus on the people who are speaking your language or not pissing you off. It's one of, the, it's one of these things where it's, if the other one wins, I'll be so pissed off.
All right. Uh, we, our, our snap poll so far on the hashtag F24 debate, 60% say Clinton won, 16% say Trump won, 4% say the American people won, <laughs> and 20% say nobody won. Right. I think it would be interesting to see, though, is what the what the percentage of those people's affiliations were because i think it's it's precisely what happened is people that were clinton supporters are going to tend to see that she won the debate people that are trump supporters uh, feel that he won the debate and as was said here each each spoke very well to their respective audiences the real key is what about the true independents who did who amongst them were persuaded in which way have you done the math on that I haven't done the math on that, but I, from what I, I've seen, um, some initial results that seem to suggest that during the first 30 minutes of the debate, uh, Donald Trump was actually leading amongst independents, and that, that, that he may have suffered later on uh, as the debate went on. All right. Each candidate with crosses to bear. In the case of Hillary Clinton, it's that private email server she kept in her home when she was Secretary of State. I made a mistake using a private email. That's for sure. Um, and if I had to do it over again, I would obviously do it differently. Um, but I'm not going to make any excuses. It was a mistake, and I take responsibility for that. How did he handle that, uh, James Robbins? I don't think Donald Trump pushed that enough, but there are two more debates. Uh, also, we have the potential of seeing more releases from the FBI investigation, from WikiLeaks, uh, from who knows what. So I don't think that this issue is going away. Mrs. Clinton simply repeated her standard talking point on this. She says she takes responsibility, but nobody actually knows what that means. Uh, how is she taking responsibility for that? I don't know. Uh, they, I think wait, that that's this interesting is what you said there a minute ago, James. You said that, that that Trump perhaps didn't push her enough. I was reading comments uh, for Clinton supporters saying she could have uh, put Trump away with one-liners and didn't do it. So it's interesting that each side is looking for these sort of knockout blow one-liners. Oh, I just meant with respect to the email issue. There's so much more there that uh, needs to be said about it. And there's more that's going to come out about it. And yes, I think that the one-liners are always entertaining. Uh, people look at these debates less as uh, policy forums than as kind of blood sports, you know, spectator sports. In that respect, I found it very entertaining. I don't know if it helps the American people uh, choose a president, but it certainly is amusing. Uh, Minter Dial, the um, Donald Trump uh, telling Fox this Tuesday that uh, he held back on uh, talking about Hillary Clinton's infidelity because he saw Chelsea Clinton in the room, but that next time he, may, he hinted he may not do so. Would that be a good idea or not? Well, uh, uh, sorry, Hillary Clinton's. Bill Clinton. Bill Clinton, I saw as much, yeah. <laughs> so uh, I, I think in the end of the day, if, he, if, if the numbers tell him that that's what's going to speak for him, then he, why not do it? I mean, he's, he's done, said so many other things. There's no reason why. He's, he says so many things about women. He says so many things in, you know, about race that are, let's say, not classically appreciated over in Europe. Should we put it, that, put it mildly? But so is it a good idea? As far as I'm concerned, I think it would not be appropriate. I would like to have someone who has an ethical standard on, on, in, in his presidency. It could campaign. backfire. And I think it could backfire, yeah. Jean-Pierre La Rochelle? Yeah, I, th I, I have to agree that I think that um, Trump missed a golden opportunity here with the emails. And this shows, this is an excellent example of of the lack of preparation um, leading to a major mistake in the what debate. What could here. he have said differently? He, he could have said a lot of things. He should have brought out, for instance, that um, they had evidence destroyed that was uh, subject to a subpoena. Uh, five, five of her aides were issued immunity. I mean, there, there's a lot more. For her to say that it's a mistake and she takes responsibility when she hasn't taken any responsibility. All right, so that was uh, um, Hillary Clinton taken to task. Then there's Donald Trump. Uh, she highlighted the fact that he has refused to release his tax returns. Maybe he doesn't want the American people, all of you watching tonight, to know that he's paid nothing in federal taxes, because the only years that anybody's ever seen were a couple of years when he had to turn them over to state authorities when he was trying to get a casino license, and they showed he didn't pay any federal income tax. So that makes if me he's smart. paid, I have no reason to believe that 
uh, he's ever going to release his tax returns because there's something he's hiding. That little that makes me smart remark, Minter Dial, does that help or hurt Trump? I think that was a terrible thing to do. I mean, it was a snide, un uncontrolled, I'm smug reaction. And, and ultimately, of course, it says I didn't pay. Uh, do you agree with that, James Robbins? Well, you know, if you're a businessman and you have uh, lawyers and accountants who can make your tax liability zero, I think that's good business. I don't necessarily think it's good politics. Personally, I think he should just release his taxes, let them out. I don't think people really care about this issue. Hillary Clinton says he's hiding something terrible. Well, what's she hiding? He could say, you know, he has said if, uh, if she'll release her emails, he'll release his taxes. I think that what they should release are the uh, financial documents of the Clinton Foundation. Personally, I think that's where the terrible things will be found. So uh, he could just get this off the table by releasing the taxes. I don't think anyone cares about it. I don't think most Americans understand their, even their own taxes, much less the taxes of uh, someone like Donald Trump, which are sure to be extremely complicated. Let everybody release all their documents. I think that that would just be a great way to move on. Yeah, I think one of the, th one, to your point though, the idea that people are judging people and, and, and like the idea of transparency when you, when they, release what they, they, if you don't release it, they feel people, you're, you're hiding something and you feel less trustworthy. And so I, I think that if you are trying to gain popularity, that's one way to try and garner some more trustworthiness. Well, that, that's precisely why Donald Trump should have countered back with, the, with uh, questions about the Clinton Foundation. So if she wants to make the argument that the lack of disclosure suggests that there's something to hide, right. he could have made a very powerful argument with the Clinton Foundation. And we already have information which is highly suggestive of apparent conflicts of interest. And he could have brought that. That would have been a perfect opportunity to bring those up. I mean, we had uranium being sold uh, eventually to the Russians through an agreement to the State Department after contributions were made to the Clinton Foundation. This is a very serious charge. And he wants to uh, um, solidify the defense stance. This would have been a perfect opportunity. To well, he did up. bring up the uranium at one point. Yeah, but this, this would have been the, at the time, I think, when she's bringing up that he's hiding something. He brought up her emails, which is a good point. But he should have also brought up the Clinton Foundation because she hasn't been uh, she's refusing to disclose the records there, despite having already signed uh, an agreement of understanding with the uh, White House to, uh, to make those disclosures. Well, it's true that this is a three-pronged battle in terms of the three debates. And so I'm sure that there, he's going to revisit areas where he didn't go in for the killer blow oh, and absolutely. likewise for her. So it's, it's interesting to look at this. I mean, anyway, we always know that debates don't necessarily swing the thing. Yeah, but you also, you know the expression, James Robbins, that uh, you never get a second chance to make a first impression. Uh, will the next two debates, I know the second one has this sort of town hall format where there'll be partially questions from the audience, uh, will there be as much interest as, as there was for the first one, where there were 80 million people watching? I think so. I think from Donald Trump's perspective in the first debate uh, where he didn't knock out Hillary Clinton, but he did get through it. He did show that he can take a punch. I think that he appealed to the people he needed to appeal to. <clears throat> the people that he didn't need to appeal to, sort of the educated elites who aren't going to vote for him anyway, he has a chance. Of, these are the people who are most criticizing him right now. I think in the second debate, he has a chance to show a more staid, a more policy-oriented uh, point of view if he wants to. Can, can he do that? Mind, the, is he capable of The race is going to be decided in places like Pennsylvania. There was a great article in the New York Post about a bar and act. Yeah. Allentown, Pennsylvania, uh, where uh, the voters, mostly Democrats or undecideds, all thought that Trump blew it up apart. You know, right. they thought that he won. Right. And those are the voters who are going to decide the election, not the elites in D.C. and New York and L.A. Yeah, because they were speaking. He, 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 they felt that in, in that article that they were speaking to their local desires, their, their, their issues in my family, my community. And it obviously resonated with them a lot more. That's a big difference. And we saw simple use of language. Yes. I was watching uh, Hillary Clinton made an appearance on Jimmy Fallon last weekend. Mm -hmm. Twice she used the word consequential. Yes. Uh, is the, if, he, if she's going to win Allentown, as, as, uh, as Mr. Robbins said, is she going to have to use 
different vocabulary. Yeah, th they both have t two different uh, challenges to overcome. So Trump has to overcome this impression that he's a scary candidate. So if we're talking about trying to get the undecided. So he has to overcome this impression that he's like this crazy guy, this scary guy. She has to, uh, on the other hand, come across as somebody that's approachable, a real person. And trust, uh, more that can be trusted. Yes, exactly, because that, that's her, her, her big problem. I mean, the, the words he, he's, China, it's sad. Mm -hmm. I mean, he, he gets it down to three letter, three letter words to pass in his big mouth. Right. Cyber is bad. What does he mean by cyber? He actually means cybersecurity, but he just little nuggets, small words. He, may, he makes some good points. I wish he would just master some more details just to add a little bit of meat. He doesn't have to. And, but he, do you agree with James Robbins that he seemed presidential, that he showed a more staid side? I, I think that uh, he improved over his in, uh, previous import, uh, previous performance. I think he's been getting some advice. Uh, I, I just wish he would prep a little bit more. I think he's he's good at taking when it, when the heat is on. He's he's shown he's capable of doing that. Basically, all his life he's had to take it, so he knows how to take the bad. But I didn't think he was presidential. Right, we're, we're now joined by by Richard Fowler, Democratic strategist uh, from Washington. Just before we go to the break, uh, uh, Richard, uh, your take: did, did Donald Trump seem more presidential? Well, uh, here's the thing. In the first 10 to 15 minutes of the debate where he was talking about trade, which is where he's strong, honestly, he sounded very presidential, like he could do the job. And then at minute around 21 or 22, he became completely and totally unhinged. He really doesn't have very much substance. When the when Lester Holt from NBC asked him the question about what will you do to stop homegrown terrorism, he went on this diatribe about you know how Hillary's plans on her website to defeat ISIS, but the question was about homegrown terrorism. The same thing we saw about race relations. When the race relations question came up, his response was law and order, uh, which makes the assumption that all African Americans or all people of color are, you know, not orderly and they need laws to make them orderly. So he had a lot of major problems that made him completely and totally unpresidential. He lacked policy substance for the first debate. All right, we're going to pick up on those points, most notably this fight uh, over the trade issue, which we'll explain why is key. Uh, to getting those undecided voters when we come back in the France 24 debate.